Continue singing. Hey, uh, <laughs> I don't want to uh, harm the people's eardrums oh. right yet because they have to hear this episode. It's one of the best episodes ever. We've already interviewed Zeus. Yes, we've interviewed Zeus. And we talk about ancient Greek philosophers. So I want to play a clip first, a 38-second clip from episode 15 with Sean Lennon in which uh, Socrates comes up. I feel like you should write like the Bitcoin Bible or something because I feel like it's one thing to have the technology, like in the case of Barlow, there was there was the internet, but he really codified the deeper implications of the internet by writing that. I feel like we, or you know, you should write something like well, that. Well, you know, I, I feel more like Socrates, who n- didn't write anything, but individually lobbied people like Plato to wake the fuck up. So, like, <laughs> yeah. I talk to people one on one. You don't need to re- write anything I've written. Just listen to my words and get lit. Man, I, I do. I do. I do. Um, and I, I really want to see you in a toga as well. <laughs> right. So we go so deep into Socrates in a bit. But I wanted to talk about all of these stories, these cycles that we keep on talking about. Because Socrates, he is, um, remember, he was sentenced to death in 399 BC for, quote, not believing in the gods of the state. Mm. So this is obviously... Um, a battle that has been going on for these past 2,700 years, separating the state from our individuality, the separation of church and state, and now the separation of money and state. But he was also, <laughs> you know, part, of, he was the original punk. Essentially, all his friends told him, like, stop being a gadfly, stop being annoying you are annoying and you're going to get executed and he wouldn't stop being annoying and publicly humiliating the, the, the elite and powerful of Athens. And one more thing, one cycle that it also um, tops is uh, this was the original Thucydides trap. Okay. He was executed essentially because of the original Thucydides trap, the battle between Athens and Sparta. And so uh, Socrates as one of the 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 intellectual of Athens, he was, um, he was kind of siding with Sparta and said, you know, they, it, it, against Athens in that he was questioning some of the, uh, the value of democracy, but also he was questioning the, the notion of might is right. Mm, right. Yeah. No, Socrates, a uh, seminal figure for sure. And it comes up in this episode. It came up in a previous episode. You know, he, he, uh, that's a great quote. You know, essentially it's about the individual versus the state. And we find this exactly debate going on right now in American political, uh, presidential politics, right? You've got one candidate who won in 2016 who was representing the individual American, uh, who beat the corporate, uh, um, uh, or state, uh, ultra super. Uh, national corporate overlords. And uh, here we are in 2020, and there's a lot of friction, a lot of tension. Uh, the state making a big comeback, uh, but a lot of people who are defending their individual rights. No better way to do that than through Bitcoin. Bitcoin restores individual rights and separates individuality, individual from state in a way that's never, ever been possible, even in Socrates' time. You know, he had to drink the hemlock in the end. Uh, with Bitcoin, you don't need to drink the hemlock. <laughs> right. And again, you know, so the the bigger picture is that he was uh, unfortunately executed because of the uh, original Thucydides trap and the Peloponnese Wars. Uh, He was also part of this separation of the state from any power and authority over the individuals. But he was also the original red pill, right? The, 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 The actions that led directly to his execution and being sentenced to death 
was because the oracle of Delphi, the original, the red pill, right? Hands you the red pill. Well, the oracle told Socrates' closest friend when asked that Socrates was the wisest man in Athens. And Socrates didn't believe it. So he, he was very upset about this and then went about, I guess everything back in those days was very public. Everything was in public, right? And he went about questioning all those other men who he thought were wise. And at, the public questioning of them uh, made him determine that they, in fact, were not wise. And they, these very powerful people got very angry with him and led to his execution, ultimately. So, I mean, but this is the thing that we're seeing in the headlines today as well in terms of... Uh, Bitcoin is humiliating the, 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 you know, the powers that control the fiat system. Right. I think that's important to understand that when you see a Noriel Rubini reacting to Bitcoin, it's not because he's having an intellectual argument anymore. It's because he's been humiliated. And the entire um, kind of field of economics and uh, starting with the introduction of the textbooks for economics study going back 50, 60 years in the post-war period are now been obsolesced by Bitcoin. And so Nuri al Rubini or uh, other economists like a, uh, Paul Krugman over, over there at the New York Times, they, they're, they, they're no longer arguing Bitcoin the, uh, from an academic point of view. They, they're reacting through the humiliation of being um, obliviated and obviated and disintermediated by this new technology that they never saw coming. And uh, same thing with Peter Schiff. And so that's where we're at. And, and when people get humiliated, they behave very badly. And again, like to reiterate, Socrates was a pain in the ass. Like he wouldn't stop publicly taunting the authorities, those who were in power, with, uh, by humiliating them about how not wise they were and questioning some basic tenets of democracy and and questioning whether or not they have the right to use so much might. So, you know, when you look at the whole Bitcoin space, what do you always hear of like, oh, the negativity around the people involved, the cyber hornets? You know, uh, it, it was Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy who came out and said, no, that I, I actually liked the, the, the cyber hornets of Bitcoin. It made me attracted to the space rather than uh, against the space. Right. Well, there was always a movement within Bitcoin for elitism. So you had the core developers like Mike Hearn was trying to become an elitist leader in the core development team. He got ejected. You had a New York agreement. You know, a lot of companies trying to co-op Bitcoin for corporate purposes. They were ejected by the cyber hornets or the nodes. And so egalitarianism rules and elitism doesn't work with Bitcoin. And as the result, what is the result of all this? You separate state from money. First time ever in history. We understand separation church and state and why that's historically significant and what that means and how it relates to the creation of the United States and all these other political movements going back hundreds of years, if not, you know, almost 3000 years, but we've never had the ability to separate money. And that is to say hard money uh, and a gold equivalent or gold uh, plus you could call it in, in superior to gold from the state. So that means the state is at risk. The nation state is at risk. All of the folks who support fiat money are now at risk. Uh, all the academics that support Keynesianism and statism and fiat money are at risk. And, uh, you know, for the 10 years now, it's been building. Now they're all beginning to get feel. You can feel the humiliation when Nouriel Rabini tweets. You, you, you don't or, or Peter Schiff tweets, you no longer are looking at it in terms of what is the point he's trying to make anymore. Mm. You are looking at it as you would look at, you know, a poor caged animal who can't get out of the cage and you feel sympathy for them and because they're just humiliating themselves in this confined space of their intellectual paucity. They, they are intellectually uh, dead inside. That's how Socrates came to the conclusion that indeed... Unfortunately, the oracle was right, that he was the wisest man in Athens because he questioned all those who he thought might be the wisest or because they proclaimed they were the wisest. They were so certain of their knowledge. And Socrates, on the other hand, was not certain of his knowledge. He was not filled with hubris. Right. Yeah, it's the Socratic method. 
as we've come to understand it, um, increased levels of questioning going down the rabbit hole and not ever accepting anything as the ultimate truth. But there's always another yes. question behind that truth. That is the Socratic method. Don't trust, verify. Okay. And so now we have it with Don't Trust, Verify, which is now, I think, a good bookend to Socrates in a lot of ways and everything yeah. that's come in between. Well, actually, now that you mention it, the Socratic method, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, constantly asking a question. Keep on asking a question until you can't get to any further. Um, and that's what the, the blockchain does, right? It constantly questions the validity of the blocks throughout history. Well, the difficulty adjustment, I think, is akin to the Socratic method, right? So every two weeks, the difficulty adjustment is pro of the protocol will question the the protocol, whether it's working, uh, whether the miners and the nodes and the market are all in sync in the way that they should be to perpetuate this perfect money. And uh, it makes an adjustment every two weeks. Um, so I think that's, a, that's Socrates, the ghost of Socrates right there on the, on the difficulty adjustment. And the result is something that humans have been, as we talked about with the interview you're about to hear, there's been a quest for uh, going back to Socrates' time of what's called the Sorcerer's Stone, uh, which is the beginning of alchemy and the idea of turning base metal into gold and transmogrification, as we understand that concept in the Catholic Church, when the, the uh, Pope and the Cardinals got together and they decided that the Eucharist would be the blood and body of Christ, the wine and the wafer. It would not be a representation of Christ, but actually through the process of transmogrification that the Catholic Church sanctioned, it was the actual blood and bone of Christ. So here with Bitcoin, the Eucharist is with us, and the coin, although virtual, is the actual hard money message from God. And therefore, <laughs> when we accept Bitcoin, we are accepting the Eucharist of Bitcoin, and we are participating in the ultimate of cosmic understanding and cosmic consciousness that Socrates kind of set the ball rolling. Yeah, that transubstantiation is a, a powerful thing. And, you know, we also asked, we were talking in this interview that's coming up about, you know, how these uh, cycles are also coincide with, so far, mostly great men, right? So here you're having the very first of the Thucydides traps happening, the Peloponnese Wars and this battle between Athens and Sparta. And erupt from that, you, you have Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Then that's as Athens is declining in power as a hegemonic power. Then you have uh, this situation in, you know, the dark ages of Europe, and overseen by the Catholic Church and the bubonic plague and the inquisitions happening and uh, order disintegrating. And into that situation erupt Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Botticelli. They come to, like, bring us to a rebirth. And, and they reference back to yes. Greek polytheism, you know, because polytheism was a hallmark of Greek civilization which led into Christianity, which was monotheism. And then that monotheistic notion was challenged in the Middle Ages by the rise of Islam. And then suddenly we had more of a polyistic, polytheistic, multipolar world. And then we heads in, that heads us into kind of the 20th century and 21st century, where we are elevating ourselves beyond theism. We're in a post-theism or post-theastic world or consciousness vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin that al algebraically or you could say algorithmically solves for God. So that quest for God is over. We found it. It's Bitcoin. And so that that satisfaction in our soul is complete. And we, it would, you know, Carl Jung would call actualization of the self has now been completed and uh, so now we're in a post, uh, a post de deity existence. Uh, we're we're now entering that post deity existence. And a lot of people are already living there. You know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin philosophers, a lot of them already live in a post theistic world, post theastic world. 
where they, um, for one thing, the whole idea of money itself is totally transformed. It's a transformation in the concept of money and everything that comes with it as well. And so that's the promise that we, that Socrates put in motion mm. that we are now realizing. Well, Socrates set in motion the notion that ourself, right? Who we are in here, it, these individuals and these individuals inspired by him through the Renaissance, then the Enlightenment, you know, the, 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 as the state started to disintegrate again and the divine right of kings and the separation of church and state, you know, into that inspired by Aristotle, uh, uh, Plato and Socrates inspired by them. You know, you have the likes of John Locke, Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot. You're right. The natural law. Yeah. Natural law of men. So it refers back to Socrates. He was, you know, basically bring up the point that the Socratic oath to know thyself. OK, yes. now, according now what we find out is that there is no bottom to that. Well, that the self-knowledge is is infinite. You can never, ever get to the bottom of the rabbit hole of yourself. Mm. Uh, you can spend your entire life knowing yourself or getting to know yourself and you will never run out of self to get to know. And so that's very challenging to the state or any authority who likes to say, well, we know who you are and you need to behave as X, Y and Z. So that's an authoritarian state dictate you or a fiat money. You need to behave like this because we know who you are. Socrates was saying, wait a minute, you don't know who I am because I don't know who I am myself. Yes. And I'm on a journey of self-knowledge. So you cannot therefore make a statutory claim about how you should govern me based on your belief that you know me because self-knowledge is a Un endless infinite well so there is no social contract between you the authority and me the individual so that does lead to the enlightenment and the rights of man and the natural order and the social contract that was put forward by john locke and his crew that between the governed and the governance there is a social contract and we have this thing called government and uh we're now we're dealing with the disintegration of the social contract because the social contract's been overwritten by the blockchain that's tied to Bitcoin. And, you know, Socrates almost kind of predicted today, this this time right now, when he was offered the chance to um, propose his own sentence, his own punishment, in which it, he, he basically uh, proposed, okay, MMT, I get uh, free money for life and free meals, okay? <laughs> so a free lunch is what he proposed for himself. And instead they decided to, uh, yeah, okay, drink this hemlock. <laughs> So, um, but, you know, I, I just think all of these ideas come together. We're part of history. We're, you know, we are connected to Socrates via our, you know, our, our inquisitive nature, our curiosity and our participation in, in, you know, uh, re a rebirth out of this fiat dark ages. So I want to, you know, we started this section with, our favorite rock star, Sean Lennon, and uh, how you said to him, you know, listen to my words and get lit. And I want to, before we throw to the next words, the section of our interview with Zeus Yamianis, um, I have to read this tweet because it fits in with this whole theme. Jimi Hendrix on Bob Dylan. When I first heard him, I thought, you must admire that guy for having that much nerve to sing so out of key. Then I listened to the words. Like this is the, the same thing, this, that the ugliness of uh, Socrates annoying everybody and causing public humiliation or the cyber hornets annoying everybody with their toxicity on Twitter, you know, uh, but listen to the words, listen to it. Right. Singing off key is what kept Bob Dylan alive all these years, because <laughs> if he was singing on key, he would have been um, <laughs> thrown in jail for True. subversive behavior and sedition long ago. <laughs> but by singing off key, it's really tough for the state to get too angry because they only hear the um, the off keyness of his voice and they're not actually listening to his words. You know, it's very subversive. Some people can hear the words like Bob Dylan and it, it gets through to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, in my own case, I like to push the, the satire button pretty hard 
because I don't want to go to jail either. It's a bit subversive. You know, my words are getting through to you through the Max Kaiser persona, which is a construction that I've worked on for many, many, 30 years, actually, that is telling truth, but in a way where those who are tone deaf to truth (laughs) will easily dismiss. So, but the people who are tuned in to truth will understand it. That's why we have the the million, 30 million viewers a, 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 a week of of Kaiser report, you know, this is because uh, why the the Spanish dubbed version gets two million views on YouTube of Kaiser report, because um, there is a huge insatiable appetite for truth out there, and um, eventually, you know, this the, look the the nation state is withering away, and that's a message that can get you in trouble if the people whose our jobs are being destroyed take it seriously. Hope right now they're too stupid, but great, but. You know, these messages, these important messages are delivered most profoundly through the words via performance art, meme art throughout history, going back to Socrates, as we're saying, uh, Renaissance art. You know, these images convey and deliver messages. So when there are people who will say to uh, Max and his like beautiful poetry, but they'll say, I wish he delivered it differently. And it's right. Like, so you can say that to Bob Dylan, right? Yeah, I wish Bob yeah. Dylan would sing on key. Yes. It's like, no, you're missing the point. He's singing off key so you can hear the words. I mean, there's a huge artistic choice being made there. It um, took somebody right. as brilliant as this guy. Right. Another yeah. artist. Jimi Hendrix. Right. Can understand what's going on here. But t- for everybody who questioned this, you know, oh, I wish he delivered in a different way. I mean, this is great because those Karens, those people are are the are the people that are anxious to lock everybody up and to <laughs> put handcuffs on everybody and to uh you know those those people we want them to be as confused as possible for True. as long as possible so that we can get this new cosmic consciousness firmly in in place uh and then they get solved algorithmically out of existence as well yeah because remember the citizens of Rome uh, not Rome the citizens of Athens did vote to put Socrates to death. So all you know. the Karens of Athens voted. Let's put Socrates <laughs> to death. He's challenging my my love of the state too much. We can't have that anymore. So, um, but you know, he he got he bequeathed Plato and Aristotle, right? So he has the last laugh ultimately. Yes, and with that, here's a good citizen, not one of those Karen citizens. Citizen Zeus, right? You know what? Here on Orange Pill Podcast, of course, we talk about Renaissance 2.0. So it's a good thing that our guest here is called Zeus. Zeus Yamianis, welcome to Orange Pill Podcast. Thank you, Stacey and Max. Really appreciate you uh, having me on. And uh, my background isn't such that I, I, I really support your Renaissance 2.0 idea. I think that's what we're having. So I hope that we have a good amount of time to talk about that. Oh, good. Right. You know, and one of the things why I mentioned Zeus, of course, is that Zeus was married to Aphrodite and Aphrodite is the um, the Greek equivalent of Venus, who was a huge topic of, of paintings for the uh, Renaissance, whether it was Botticelli or Titian. They loved Venus. So um, one thing I want to ask you is, Let's talk about that, the cycles, because I've been reading, you, you know, you talk about these cycles of history and, and, and when I look back on it, I see, let's start with your heritage of Greek. I see it all really starting Western civilization and this mind expansion of humans, starting with Socrates, Plato, and then Aristotle. And then you had the Renaissance and a, a group of guys again, you know, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Raphael. Then you had the French Enlightenment and, you know, that came out of John Locke and Rousseau and Voltaire and these great thinkers, you know, so the, the time period is getting shorter between them, like 300 years instead of thousand years. But right. I mean, could we be in this sort of thing? Because we do see this emergence of sort of solar punk, cypher punk, like these groups of, of individuals working together to create, um, to better mankind. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think what's happening is like you're saying, it's accelerating the, the sine waves are being compressed, I guess, in terms of the historical cycles. 
and you know things like technology are beginning to bring those together, giving us, I think, an accumulation and a transformation of that previous wisdom. I think what's happened is we've now reached a time in our history where it's one more global in a way that's never been true before, more interconnected in a way that's never been true before. Individual minds have access to more information like we never have before. It's creating a somewhat unprecedented environment. I was listening to your previous Orange Pillow with Brendan Quidham, and you had a little bit of debate about whether there's gonna be a fifth wave or something somewhat unprecedented happening here. And though those undercurrent waves may rhyme, as Max was saying, I do believe we are going to have something somewhat unprecedented happening here. The conditions are unique. They are global, they are interconnected, and the force behind them is beginning to rise significantly. That's why this thing about Bitcoin is becoming more and more interesting and more and more relevant. Because you look at that as a monetary system and you try to go back through history, there is no precedent for it. There just is not. Even in idea. You know, there was no great predictors or no funky system built way back when or some island economy that has it. So I think it would be a, a unwise to underestimate the, these, the Renaissance 2.0 is truly a 2.0. It's not a 1.2 or a 1.3. <laughs> it is a departure from these things for a lot of reasons. We haven't had the kind of environmental challenges and degradation that we need to take care of. And techno utopia is not going to do it alone. We need a human renaissance in the ways that we think, in the ways that we feel, in the ways that we connect to each other, and values, not just moral values, but the way that we see value. And the way that I talk about in my book is we're moving from a thing value which is typical monetary system, ownership, uh, competition, empire, to use value, right? We're moving from possession to experience. There's something fundamentally changing here in this Renaissance 2.0, which is beginning to see non-material things as having real value, okay? And that's part of the difficulty right now with Bitcoin is people say it's, it's airy, it's non-material. But then you say, but you use Spotify, right? <laughs> That's area and non-material too. You're not buying the CD, et cetera. You're buying the subscription and you're beginning to hear the music. And so there's a, a bit of an analogy here. It, it, this is what I see as unprecedented, okay? This transfer from the much more material-based understanding of value and meaning to a much more relationship and experience-based non-material use value is what... Um, not only invites some interesting discussion on Bitcoin, among other things, but on the nature of our interrelations and where human society is going in an unprecedented way. Right. You mentioned the, the non-material and how we, this is more of a hallmark of what we're seeing today versus a, a certain materialism. But going back to uh, Greek the Greek days, uh, you know, you had the non-material concepts of honor, heroic, nobility, that were codified to some degree and made real uh, mm -hmm. through literature, through art. Uh, so there is a connection there. Now, you mentioned that a big difference here is that the network, there's a network difference here and that, for example, the individual has access to almost unlimited information these days, which is very different. But uh, I wanted to ask you about the whole idea of philosophy itself, something that was created more or less with Socrates and... Um, are we entering a period where maybe the death of philosophy, and what I mean by this is that philosophy by its nature is kind of the how to organize knowledge, you know, the knowledge of knowledge, the meta-knowledge, the metaphysical knowledge. But if all yeah. information is available instantaneously to all people always, then we don't need a way to know how to know anymore. We <laughs> simply know. We know, and it's being piped in through our conscious and unconscious and collective unconscious instantaneously. Right. So do we even need philosophy any, anymore, or have we evolved away from it? We need it more than ever. Um, the, 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 the reason why we need philosophy more is that it's sort of like philosophy is dead in some ways it seems to be, but long live philosophy. I think that there has been no time greater in the last probably a thousand years that we've needed philosophy because we have such an onslaught of information 
And information is not knowledge. And especially with technologies used to propagandize, package, and appeal to the emotion underpinnings, the unexamined and unconscious emotional underpinnings of people, you need a critical framework to suss out truth, whether it has any match to the empirical world, whether it's material or non-material. And you need to be able to talk about things like virtue and value. I think there's going to be a renaissance of virtue, things like how uh, uh, it, courage versus cowardice, creativity, compassion, as real value, because we're getting used to non-material, because virtue is seem to be non-material, but they are character attributes that have real life imports that have significant consequence and power. So I think philosophy is going to be a reawakened philosophy that does draw upon the ancient Greeks, among others, continental philosophy. Nietzsche is my favorite, actually. <laughs> I love Nietzsche. <laughs> he is still ahead of his time. If you read Beyond Good and Evil, you will see a man who is still talking about a world yet to emerge. And that's 125 years, 150 years ago. So what, what Nietzsche said, and I'll include the Greek philosophers in this too, is that talked about, you know, they, they try to use them to say about the ubermensch, the overman. But what he is really talking about is this Dionysian overflowing. And this Dionysian overflowing is about this artistic, poetic explosion uh, where in a more non-material way, we are learning to understand we have our own genius within us, and that's our real source of value. And we need a critical framework and a creative framework, both to weed out the manipulation and propaganda we're getting to use us and get rid of our individual sovereignty, but also to find creative, co-creative ways for us to connect and create a true economy of that connection. And to find out, use technology and currency systems that support that, rather than that take that away. Right. So you refer to the genius within that we all have an inner genius. And um, again, going back to ancient philosophers, there was a, a notion of how to tease that out. And we're going to tease that out by organizing our knowledge in a way to philosophically delve into what our better natures are and come up with concepts of, of, of heroic, honorable concepts. But my, my question is to try to dig into it a little bit more here, is that with the technological overlay that's connecting all of our conscious minds and unconscious minds and making all information instantaneously available to everybody, can it, is there room for the possibility of our, our species to make this kind of quantum philosophical leap simultaneously where we just simply know? Whereas my point is this, philosophy gives you an entry into how to find truth. But is it possible that we may be struck with truth globally, instantaneously, and just live in a truthful post-philosophical era? Um, unmediated truth, is that what you're yeah. sort of getting yeah. at? Unmediated truth would be a way to, to, to phrase that, yeah. I think there's going to be a mix of the two. We're going to be struck by certain things that don't require philosophy. Uh, environmental sustainability and environmental limitations. Uh, COVID-19 is a great way to look at us getting struck with something in which philosophy can help us handle the effects of, to a certain extent, what does life mean? Is it okay to sacrifice people in old, you know, in, in these in long-term care facilities that are dying at record rates? You know, so it can help us manage the effects. It's not going to necessarily help us understand we're going to be kind of gobsmacked by, and we are being gobsmacked by things that philosophy is not going to help us face directly. It's going to help us face the consequences of that. But the nice thing about philosophy, I think as well, is it helps us to anticipate and not simply be traumatized and reactive. It can say, wait a minute, what are the opportunities being created by COVID? How's it causing us to rearrange our world, reflect on ourselves? One of the things that I've been talking about in some of my videos is it's helping us understand that we've been in a cranked up progress oriented endless activity and growth that's completely unsustainable like in our nervous system we call that the sympathetic right the sympathetic ramp up and like any cycle and any healthy system you need a parasympathetic re refractive or reflective relaxed stage and we've decided we're not going to do that we're going to continue to manipulate the market upward even if it needs to crash even if it needs to relax we're going to continue to manipulate debt upward, 
even though there should be jubilee to allow for that thing to come down. So, so with, with philosophy, and not academic philosophy, but applied, what I call applied philosophy, we can say, wait a minute, we can see we can no longer do this, but what's the world gonna look like that we have to go toward? And what, is, what, what are the structures and ways to evaluate that? And what are the inventive or creative tools or experiments we might try to help move us into a much more vital world, not just sustainable, but vital world? Well, I mean, there's so much to unpack there because, of course, hubris is one of the things that the Greek tra tragedy writers, uh, as Max studied at NYU, you know, th this is what they wrote about all the time. This is a, a, a quality of man that has existed for thousands of years now, and we know this, and it brings about our doom every time. That's why we know this mm -hmm. cycle will happen. Um, but in terms of this, uh, you know, of these cycles that keep on happening in philosophy, part of that hubris and these cycles is that, you know, there's always a, a battle between the elite and th the vast majority. And right. part of what is uh, with this Bitcoin community and the orange pill is the same you've always seen throughout history, you know, through all the oppressed. It's like you can, um, you know, bash the person, you can batter them and beat them, but you can't kill their ideas, right? So right. that's the one thing that has, as you said, you know, the history of money has never seen anything like Bitcoin. And, right. you know, you could, it's a mind wallet, right? You could have a brain wallet, like all your keys in your head memorized. They can't kill that idea. They can't kill that. And there's no way for them, the state to reach in there, the powerful, the elite, the kings, the pharaohs to reach in there and grab your wealth from you. And I think that's, you know, like philosophy, that's something exactly like Plato would argue with uh, Aristotle about. And, and, and these are grand, I think it's a really pivotal moment in human history. Yeah, I, I think the philosophy, if you look back in Plato's Republic, they had a notion, and education itself means to educ, to lead out. The notion is that we have the knowledge within us, talking about that genius, and these technologies, currency systems, are meant to lead that out, and I would say also to connect it. The problem before this time, and this is why it is unprecedented, is that philosophy always understood things like power, right? to be more or less still attached to and governed and largely controlled by elites. And it has throughout history. There hasn't been a mechanism to allow that power to be challenged effectively from the grassroots up. Now we are seeing just the tip of a potential for that to happen for the, in the first time in human history. And distributed value, like you say with Bitcoin being one example, where you can literally possess individually, but have it connected globally to access to wealth that you yourself can control or your community can. Because in our last conversation on Max Geyser, I talked about maybe pegging local currency to Bitcoin or something like that. So you have an extension of that personal sovereignty being brought into a community in which, uh, it w which is much more res resistant to manipulation by central banks, power, and, and elite individuals. So there is a potential there. And it's still based in that, that ancient philosophy that had at its root, the, at least ancient Greek philosophy, that the individual is connected to this larger knowledge. It comes through that individual, and that's where the real value comes from. The elites have inverted that through history. They say, no. It virtues are intrinsic, just like this genius or this talent and worth and labor that someone puts in that has that intrinsic value. The elite said, nope, actually, you have only instrumental value. You are human capital, not relationship capital, human capital. You are fodder for my aggrandizement and my amassing of some kind of empire or wealth. So your worth and value comes in relationship to me, and I will extort, I will leverage my power, my sometimes military power, to force you into a subservient position to me. And you can only have derivative power that comes through my great hubristic, <laughs> you know, empire. <laughs> and now we're saying no. And, and I think one of the most amazing innovations that's happened within the last century is nonviolent civil disobedience. 
there was the development of nonviolent discipline that said no. And I've even written about this in that one article about rebelling against big everything, where we said, uh-uh, we are not going to participate in your mad consumeristic rush and your mad Christmas, you know, uh, orgies. <laughs> you just squeeze into malls. And COVID is helping with all of this, by the way. It's really forcing us into that area. And, and, and it's getting people to be more reflective. Wait a minute, I don't really like to do all that frenetic. I don't need to buy all this stuff and insure it and then just slave at work in order to make it happen. So these are emotional things that are happening, feelings, things are happening, reflective things are happening. But again, I think philosophy can say, aha, do you see now that you have that experience and that taste? Let's go ahead and play that out. Let's develop a system where we are organized how we can take advantage of this. And civil disobedience was a combination of a kind of philosophical understanding meeting practical action. It says, wait a minute, the real power comes from us. The real value comes from us because if we don't participate, guess what happens to those guys that say that we derive all our value from them? They fall. And you know, in the last election, that was seen by the Mad King. <laughs> he, he thought all value derived from him and that he was just going to cakewalk into the next four years. And it turned out it didn't happen because people rebelled. There was a nonviolent civil disobedience. People went to the voting booths and said, we want you out. Right. Yeah. All this uh, discussion of ancient Greece and Greek, ancient Greek philosophy, you know, got me thinking and got my mind uh, reaching back into ideas. And um, I, I fell upon this idea of the philosopher's stone. So the philosopher's stone goes back to ancient Greece. It, it's kind of this idea of turning base metal into gold. Uh, it's the foundation for alchemy. And uh, it was, there's a whole history of it uh, going back to ancient Greece. But my question is, um, Zeus, with, with Bitcoin, it, it's almost acting like a philosopher's stone. Um, it's turning base energy into immutable, unconfiscatable gold or digital gold. That seems awfully like, alchem like alchemy. It also has uh, a very strange, another Greek phenomenon, another Greek process you know, uh, I guess reference is that some people look at Bitcoin and they become very ugly. Like they're looking at Medusa. You know, you have mm -hmm. some people look at Bitcoin like Nouriel Rubini and, and snakes start growing out of his head, you know, right. because he doesn't understand <laughs> it. He doesn't want to understand it. He, he, his soul is not ready to move on to the next, the next reality that we're all talking about here that ancient Greeks postulated with this idea of the philosopher's stone. Is there a connection? between the Philosopher's Stone and Bitcoin? I think it's actually not bad in terms of, it's quite apt in the sense that they see it from the negative perspective. They see it as, as snake oil, basically. They say, this is a potion that you're handing out that's supposed to cure all ills and it's really just a, it doesn't tie to anything, you know? And, um, and I, but, but in order to see it that way, you have to tie your understanding to historical notions of value as thing value, okay? As we get into a more non-material space, and there are some hazards here, okay? <laughs> you know, um, if you forget that, you know, the, the combination in your head and somehow you don't have access to your money, there are some, I would say it's fairly minor hazards. But I think the reason why their heads are exploding is because their notion of value has the entire momentum of thing value behind it. Commodity, and even your last guest talked about he's seeing Bitcoin as simply a commodity. Again, commodities are things, right? Stores of values in actual things. But in the, in it, the thing that's intriguing to me, quite apart from that, about Bitcoin, that is the most intriguing, and I've been doing a lot of research since our last talk on this, is its potential for use value. Even if it had no inherent value, which is hard for people to wrap their head around because we've attached our inherent value to something tangible, right? It's a thing, right? So, uh, so one can be somewhat forgiven by saying, wait a minute, poof, it's gone, but it's still there. You know, it's still in the, in the cyber waves or it's still in your head. But here's what I would say. And I think this might be the next wave and where Bitcoin could become really, really salient to people in a way that gets into not only use value, but applied use value that they can see the value working in their world. If you were able to say Bitcoin is the most secure, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, to, I think it's Brandon Quidham, because I did see that, um, that interview. 
He talked about the algorithms in Bitcoin preventing manipulation and also guarding against some of the vices. This goes back to philosophy, right? Like greed, like the desire to acquire, to concentrate, to monopolize, which is the death. If you look in the natural system, once you have one species, right now it's human beings, who acquire monopoly power in that system, that system will die pretty quickly. There's not the diversity, there's not the exchange, and there's not, there's not the distinctness that is required to make a healthy system. A healthy financial system requires the same thing. A healthy philo philosophical system requires the same thing. It requires diversity of ideas, distinctness of identity, my unique genius or talent that I'm contributing, and exchange. Monopolies get rid of all three of those. Bitcoin, especially if it's tied to something like local currency, and it can be used as a medium, not just a store of value or a thing, that's where it kind of is right now, but as a mechanism or platform, okay? Secure platform that cannot be manipulated like Facebook is manipulating us, like all these social medias are, then it would allow for creativity and it would create, it basically would have creativity value and connectivity value. And that's what I find most interesting about Bitcoin. And not many people are talking about it because they're still trying to find a way to secure. It's a little bit fear driven, secure their value or preserve their wealth. But think about it in progressive terms. What can it help generate or connect up with to create new innovations that allow for new experiences, new forms of value that tend to be more non-material and new forms of, of community? And that's, that to me is what I'm really intrigued with. Right. And let's, again, tie all this together. The ancient Greek philosopher uh, Aristotle is still the guy you go to for the sound qualities of sound money and the uh, three parameters of great drama. And I focused, I studied at university at UCLA, uh, the English lit and drama side. So I know from Aristotle that a great drama, which is tragedy, is man versus man, man versus himself, or man versus nature. So, I mean, we have all that, that cycle always goes on, and we see that now. We see it through history. We see it into the birth of uh, the Renaissance, which was a, um, a collapse in the faith of the institutions. In that time, it was the Catholic Church that, that, that didn't have an answer or a, a, an adequate response to the bubonic plague. They didn't know what the heck this was, how half the population had dropped dead. And the same we see now since repeated financial collapse, 2000, the, the dot-com crash, then the huge crash in 2008, and the central banks just keep printing money, and then we see COVID, and it, like everything seems to be a response. Our, our elite are essentially doing the same thing as back then, you know, drilling holes in our head and putting leeches on our body, hoping like that, that the body politic and the economics will uh, somehow recover. So we're losing faith in them. But it, it, all we could do in all we have done, most people, is just sit and watch in horror. But I think, you know, you have, like we're saying, we have Bitcoin, we have the cypherpunk communities, we have the orange pills community, we have solar punks, like, which I think is more kind of your background, like the solar punk sort of e ethics of like, um, you know, just doing it, living it, uh, a decentralized life style. Um, so let's tie that into what Paul Tudor Jones said, and I don't know who, if you know who he is, but he's a very famous hedge fund investor and he's super successful. And the reason why he's so successful is he, you have to understand these cycles. You have to understand humans. You have to understand the people in the economy and cycles. And he is invested in gold, but he's also started, he's the first major, major famous legendary investor to invest in Bitcoin. And he said that Bitcoin is a bet on humanity. It's a bet on human ingenuity versus gold, which is a bet that it's all going to crash and it's all going to be horrible and every man for himself. He's saying Bitcoin is a bet on the opposite, that, yeah, the elites may fail, but the people won't. I do think he's right. Here's the, I mean, I, using a philosophical technique of falsification and elimination. Right. That's how I kind of came at Bitcoin here, because, you know, I was a little bit skeptical. I mean, I was like, hmm, because I've seen too, too much hubris in the system. Oh, my gosh, there's so much you know, value here in the volatility and so forth. So I'm, I wasn't skeptical 
of the inherent value or worth of Bitcoin per se, but just about humans around it, right? <laughs> they, you know, they, they, the motives and the hubris around it didn't uh, make me say that it could be used irresponsibly. But then I asked myself this question from the philosophical. Okay, we're going to use falsification. We're going to take away what can't be true, okay? And we're going to use elimination. We're going to eliminate those things that are unnecessary, okay? And, and then I asked myself, okay, let's look at Bitcoin with the falsification elimination. I said, can it be used by elites? You know, and I, and I said this in our other interview, well, it still has, can be bought with actual dollars. And if the elites are hollowing out assets and pumping up those assets and, and borrowing tons of frictionless interest-free money, can't they just buy up the entire Bitcoin market? But here's the thing that resists that. And it didn't occur to me until after, uh, Max, you were challenging me to think of Bitcoin in new ways. Um, the problem with Bitcoin, even if they're doing this, okay, and I think you mentioned this, Max, Max was that we can go on too. And if they manipulate it up, it goes up with us and down with us. So manipulation doesn't work as well with that because we can, and they can't control the money supply. They can't control it. They can buy it up, but they can't just print dollars. So there's something that is like an immune response. That Bitcoin has a certain kind of immune response to the kind of centralization, elite, and manipulation that is not true of any other currency, even gold, because they manipulated the price of gold big time, right? So Mm, then I'm starting to say, mm. and again, this is where applied philosophy does help even today. I started saying, wait a minute, and especially if you could connect it to use value in terms of creativity and connectivity, and people basically take it over and connect it to state banks. California's, North Dakota did that. California's getting into that now. Governor Newsom is looking into that. All of a sudden, we cut out the middleman. And if we have it connected to a non-manipulated currency or pegged to a non-manipulated currency, now who's going to go ahead and come after you? Because what we have now, uh, and to go to your point, uh, Stacey, is we don't just have these bailouts, but we now have, in an unprecedented way, a separation. Where literally perfidy, vice is being rewarded if you're an elite. Not only are you not getting prosecuted, you're getting money thrown at you to the tune of trillions of dollars. The worse you are, the more vicious you are, the more unsustainable you are, the more money you get. We saw that with the bailouts around the virus, around COVID. Literally, even the small business ones were connected, big businesses that had fewer than 50 employees, including hedge funds. So it's not just the fact that people are now frustrated, people are not getting prosecuted, that they're actually being rewarded. Now they're seeing that separation. They're now seeing their own survival and well-being being in direct contrast and competition with a fiat currency system that is shown it will only reward the worst and the fewest. And this, again, is, I think, where philosophy comes in, but one that has a little bit of courage and a little bit of practical application, where we, where we look at that and say, uh-uh, we are not going, we are going to find a mechanism to tie our value to that cannot be manipulated. And Bitcoin is probably the best candidate for that right now. And we're going to develop an innovation or platform around that to make it so that you have to listen to us. Okay. You can rig the voting system <laughs> even a little bit. They didn't, weren't able to rig it enough to change the outcome this time, but we need something more secure. And it looks like, and I haven't seen a better candidate right now offered than Bitcoin. So it looks like Bitcoin may play a, an important role in that. Um, again, I'm still a little skeptical about the humanity around it, but I'm hopeful. Right. Well, first of all, the word perfidy is an awesome word that I encourage everyone to start using in their vocabulary liberally <laughs> to describe the banksters and all the folks that we like to uh, point the finger at because it's an awesome, <laughs> awesome word. Um, also, the rule by the worst. I think that's another Greek invention or a word called a cacistocracy. This is the rule by yep. the worst amongst us, right? But mm -hmm. now when you talk about local, you know, I get the idea, okay, you've got a local currency and here's Bitcoin and there's a local need for it. And it's, you've got the local community uh, doing stuff for the benefit of the local community. And they're not taking orders from the top down, from the elites, from the oligopolists. 
and, and I get that. But but to dig into this, maybe a little, this idea of localism may be a little deeper, you know, and, and going back to our Greek philosophers, going back to Socrates, who, of course, famously said, know thyself. So is it possible that the local can be, can we can winnow it down to one's own self and one own thoughts? In other words, with Bitcoin, it, there's a, there's this, this will be kind of a philosophical discussion here, but it's possible for a monetization of one's own thoughts. Uh, we've got uh, the brain running at a billion uh, calculations per second, I believe. Uh, you've got trillions of neurons. Well, Bitcoin is running at 120 quintillion calculations per second, and um, it's divisible to 100 million places. So potentially the mind could be monetized in a way where our thinking of philosophically in our own head is, is, the, is kind of a frictionless, perfect price discovery that goes on in knowing thyself. In other words, you've got a perfect way to know yourself. And if you do absolutely know yourself, or Descartes also echoed this when he said, I think, therefore I am, right? If you actually have a way to know yourself in a pristine, perfect way. Right. And, and it, can we, so my, my question is this, is this idea of localism, can we take it all the way down to the individual and with the assistance of the monetary policy of Bitcoin combined with our consciousness, we have the, we have the pr delivery of the promise that was made 2,700 years ago or so, or so, to know thyself. Are we about to know who we are? That's the question. I think so, because the medium reflects each other. First of all, I do think of these as kind of Petrushka dolls, concentric circles, right? The individual is a universe. The community is a universe. And it goes over. The artificial stuff like states and countries, you know, for the most part, <laughs> you know, I... Individual relationship, society, cosmos, that's, you know, that's pretty much what you need to know. And these other arrangements, uh, you know, I'm, I'm less uh, high on. But to get to your, to get to your point, Max, yes. I mean, it, it, you, when I, I've taught this course called, uh, psychology course called Motivation and Emotion, okay? And what that is, is a kind of Bitcoinification of your understanding of your own emotions, Okay. So much of the inefficiency and the suffering in this world is created by misunderstandings or incompatibilities or manipulations or vices like greed taking over productive, healthy functions. So if you want to have a healthy mind and individual, you begin to develop a way of thinking that can be much like Bitcoin can be kind of checked a blockchain, if you will, <laughs> of, of, of investigation of your emotions and whether they serve you or not and where you've been and how that relates to where you are now. Um, and if we do that, this is why I say they're, they're kind of the, the two mediums, the structures are similar. So what I'm trying to teach in this emotion motivation class is to get rid of the dirty money, is to get rid of the friction points and the misunderstandings, not by just developing communication and a lot of these sort of faux new agey ideas to paste over, but to see these friction points as a learning opportunity to create clearer thinking, simpler thinking, and so forth. We see with our current monetary system, it, if it was it converted into the emotions of an individual, it would be nuts. It'd be psychotic, okay? It literally is rewarding the worst in us and most unhealthy. And I look at healthcare, it's not healthcare, it's sick neglect. It literally, if you look at our healthcare system, it's founded upon getting people sick that can pay money, okay? <laughs> Curing no one, denying premiums to everybody who, you know, charging maximum premiums and denying care to everyone. So that is the equivalent of an individual in their, in their mind without a blockchain who's just going from emotion to emotion, addiction to addiction, uh, ideological crazy thinking to an ideological crazy thinking. There's nothing systematic there. There's nothing evening and out or buffering or connecting it or providing a rational basis. Now, blockchain, thinking about it, blockchain, blockchain provides that rational basis, right? It doesn't simply, it's not just simply air to some kind of hubris. It's not simply air to some kind of whim or some kind of emotional storm, or even something like a COVID virus coming in sideways, okay? It doesn't, it's not as a, 
open to or influenced by things like fear. We're still straightening that out a little bit because a lot of people getting into Bitcoin and doing it out of fear. That's true. They're doing it out of these emotions. But if we can develop productive and healthy ways to move from this fear-based, more consumer-based way of understanding it to a more production, creativity, and health-based way of understanding it, I think Bitcoin is well-positioned to do that because its underlying structure is clean. Okay, so that part is there. I mean, you can test it. It's not just to, you know, it's not just a philosophical speculation. <laughs> and you can even test it philosophically by saying, wait a minute, what are the mechanisms within Bitcoin that help it resist these kinds of whims and emotions and manipulation? And you look and you look into the mechanism of blockchain and you can see real underlying uh, protections or immunizations against that. So it may not be fully developed. It may have be, be nascent and there may be some craziness around it. But, you know, when you buy a house that's under undervalued because it has bad carpets, right? And, and, and people just look at the, you know, oh, this doesn't give me a good feeling. It's got bad carpets. And then you're the smart one. And you look around and you go, this thing is way undervalued just because these people didn't take care of the roof and put some bad carpet in. I could do that like that. <laughs> I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to live in this house and or sell it for a huge profit because I know that the bones are good, right? I, I know this is that one that built in 1910 when they use real wood, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and it's in good shape. So I think Bitcoin might be like that house, right? It might be like that house that has good bones, the way it's being used, the humanity is around it, some of the fear and manipulation right now, maybe giving people pause because they're like, you know, they're looking at, you know, like the people running through a, an open house. They're looking at other people and they're going, I don't know. But if you look deeper into the bones of it, I think it has a pretty decent set of foundation, you know, and I think it has a promising foundation from my point of view, not just as a store of wealth, not just as a, 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 as some kind of shelter in the storm, but exactly as this man you said said it, as an investment in humanity, because you can see it can't be manipulated and it can be connected with forms of hum healthy forms of human exchange, right? And individual sovereignty and empowerment, because now your value is coming up, like you said, Max, from here and being connected to that exchange value. I think it would be much more amenable for individual talent an assessment of that talent and trying to improve the world than money and reputations and degrees, which don't confer any of that. They just prestige there. They don't actually measure your skill and your ability to do something effectively. So I think both on the individual level and, and on the more communal level, I think that there's some promising promise here. Right. Yeah. No, that sounds all very good. You know, to, just to reemphasize a point I was making earlier about are we in a post philosophical age? You, you know, you just said uh, with Bitcoin, it's not just philosophical because we can test it. Right. That's that sounds to me like we're talking about the post philosophical age. You know, it's uh, it's already fully tested. It's verified. But what I wanted to ask is this, um, with this idea of self-knowledge and with this idea of knowing ourselves and potentially to a state of perfection, which, you know, Bitcoin has a lot of things that are perfect about it as a perfect money, perfect emission schedule, the perfect uh, balancing of incentives. All of these things have come together in this philosopher's stone moment, a lightning strike of, strike of perfection. But... It, are, is it possible to think about in terms of do we get to the point where if, in fact, I'm internalizing the Bitcoin protocol in my mind so thoroughly that I have a frictionless one on one relationship with myself, as Socrates would talk of, do I also, therefore, you know, what happens to the concept of money? What happens to the concept of of money itself? Because what I've noticed in this community is that. A lot of people in this community, particularly those who are on paper on Bitcoin, worth a considerable amount. Uh, they've kind of like entered a different phase of consciousness where it's like, well, my inner peace that I got through Bitcoin is actually incalculably valuable and everything else are just shells. 
Well, I would say that um, the, the way in which they correspond, I'm not sure one is directly connected to the other, is that when you do uh, appropriate self-examination and the philosophy, self-reflective, know thyself examination of your, you know, I think of Socrates himself had said the unexamined life, or it was Aristotle, the unexamined life is not worth living. <laughs> um, and when you do that in a way that's positive and productive, meant to clarify yourself and meant to elevate yourself, then you, you, you create value by doing that. By eliminating this friction, you're create, you are eliminating a lot of suffering that has value, right? And by creating forms of currency that eliminate manipulation in which, as with disaster capitalism, you can, quote, succeed by making other people suffer more and gain more by making other people suffer more. And if you connect to a currency that prevents that from happening, you're going to really, really support the positive aspects and the immune system's ability to eliminate and clear out and clean out the negative aspects of it. So again, when I look at philosophy, I think in terms of practical philosophy, I look at, it's not just a method where one clears oneself out and has that frictionless understanding of themselves. Um, there's always going to be ways to refine that. And once you've got that down, I know a lot of people who have pretty good self-knowledge, but they have crappy relationships. <laughs> so <laughs> then you have to go to the next concentric circle and you have to say, okay, I've got myself down pretty well. I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty stable. I've invested in this. I'm pretty financially secure. Now I'm going to move to the next stage. I'm going to connect that with somebody else, meet their genius, their knowledge. And there's going to be friction there because the way that I think and experience the world is not going to be the same as theirs. That's one of the great, you know, uh, challenges of relationships. I had a great conversation just this morning with my wife about the different ways we look at conversation. And, it, you know, we've talked around this, but it took a while for my world to begin to feel into and understand philosophically probe and, and, and translate it into mine to, to, to make it make more sense to me. And it is beginning to work over time. And the same is true with individuals. And the same is true with monetary systems. When I say testing, you know, Bitcoin, this is what I kind of mean by testing it. It's you test it in different situations. It tests to see how it will work. You experiment with linking it up with other forms of value and seeing how that's going to work. And that's an ongoing process. And it does require a valuative and philosophic mind to aid in that. Now, not everyone's a philosopher with regard to knowing that themselves, nor knowing other people necessarily. But the ability or the craft of engaging that in an open-ended way without feeling you found the answer. I mean, some critiques of Bitcoin and other forms of, of value say, it's the answer, you know, it, it's, it's almost like the end point. You just go ahead and invest in Bitcoin and you're gonna be fine. To me, I think it's the beginning rather than the conclusion. An investment in humanity and individual sovereignty, and that's what makes it interesting to me, right? Because I'm not looking for a fundamentalist final answer about my world and my life. I'm a creative individual. That would be death to me. So is it going to be healthy and really foster that creativity and innovation and feelings of goodwill and good health and, and interesting thinking, just like a good conversation, or is it going to do the opposite? That's how I test it. And as I've been doing some research on this, it's actually pointing itself in that positive direction. So I've, it's proven itself, is beginning to prove itself to me and, and my experience. And that's how I'm at least initially testing this. I haven't done a lot of investing in it and so forth and looking into the mechanisms of it, done a little bit on that, but it's actually drawing me into that direction. Right. There's a phrase in uh, Bitcoin is do your own research. Make sure you understand it before you invest in it. But, you know, if you're a psychologist, so I want to wrap up with Nozomi Hayes, who is a liberation psychologist. And she is such a great speaker on Bitcoin. And when she did Orange Pill podcast, she mentioned these institutions that humans create throughout the centuries, the millennia to control our negative dark side, our greed, our right. fear, all those things. And she said, that's mm -hmm. the brilliant thing about what the Bitcoin protocol has done is it doesn't punish. It rewards you. It, it, it turns your greed into altruism because right. by uh, mining Bitcoin, wanting to secure more value, 
you're actually securing the entire network of millions of people around the world. You're securing their wealth. You know, you're helping them out. You're, it's an altruistic behavior to engage in the protocol. So, you know, I, I think that's an interesting way to tie all this together as we fight these constant cycles of hubristic leaders and failed institutions throughout the millennia. And Bitcoin is something that seems to recognize these cycles of, of human qualities that will always fail in the institutions we've so far set up throughout the millennia. Well, there's a radical separation between self well-being and other well-being in the old philosophical and practical system. Um, Forms like Sun Exchange, you guys, your sponsor. Um, we, we've invested in a, in a vegan business that does vegan salmon <laughs> up in Vancouver, um, uh, and also Bitcoin is saying that that is going to be monumentally changed. You don't even have to have control over your vices to set structurally up a system that rewards yourself in partnership and collaboration with rewarding others and also helping you protect against your worst instincts and the instincts of others. And, that, it, it, and you can create structure around that. You don't have to make it an individual will or effort. That will never succeed. And, and it, it gives rise to all kinds of really, really horrendous religious doctrines of original sin. We have original blessing here in the genius that we have in the life that we're given and the value that we exchange, okay? And that if there's any sinful errant or vice that gets in the way of that, that becomes a design problem rather than some kind of big shame. And, you know, I need to go <laughs> give alms to the church and be abs you know, have absolution. You know, <clears throat> no, what we need to do is raise this part up and create structures that allow us to be rewarded for that. And that give you some immune strength against the worst aspects of ourselves. So I, I completely agree with you, Stacey. You know, this is, this is built in. It's not just a, a, an effort of will. It's structural, right? It, it's, it's a structural protection, just like a good immune system is structural protection. You don't need that injection of immunization and so forth, and COVID is one of these ways. As much, and, and vaccines to one degree or another can help, but they cannot create the foundation of well-being exercise, eating well, <laughs> and the same is true, you know, sleep, hydration, <clears throat> eating the right vitamins, those provide, provide the structure and the foundation, and the same is true of monetary systems. We can have QE and injections and all kinds of drugs coming in, pills pop, that will never create a healthy economy, just as those things to a human body will never create a healthy human body. They may help a little here and there, to adjust in times of stress, but they can't provide the foundation. What I like about what you're saying, Stacey, is, it, is we're looking at a more foundation structure or design-based way that is truly health forming, health producing, rather than one that's just trying to beat back the worst of us, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine if you were to give the average person on the street a choice between these two systems, one in which they have to use their will and their suffering and their paranoia to keep beating back and then try to get on a vacation or watch a movie to try to squirrel away just a little bit of pleasant time versus one in which the norm is contribution, creativity, collaboration, and monetary systems that support that. And every once in a while, some you know, in, in, in environmental catastrophe, something comes along and you're like, eh, we can deal with it by working together. I think almost everybody will go with the latter rather than the former. So, I mean, again, and, and I think, you know, we need to get inventive about connecting that up with actual monetary and currency systems. And if Bitcoin looks to be one of those, and I think it does, I'm open to a discussion on this one from anyone out there, then let's go ahead and have that discussion. Well, it's really awesome to see you be orange pilled. And I hope you join our telegram group because people would love to chat to you in there, but do you have a website or anywhere else that people can get in touch or? Um, yeah, I have citizenzeus.com. Okay. Uh, that's my personal website. Uh, my counseling website is askdrzeus.com. If people are interested in, in inter if you're interested in emotion, motivation and in, in relationships and want an actual counseling session, you can do that. But in terms of my more political and economics, you know, emphasis, that's, that's um, citizenzeus.com. 
And they can get in, they can get in touch with me at Zeus at citizenzeus.com. And I do answer emails. So please uh, feel free. I, I can tell Max, you know, who did study Greek tragedies and Greek uh, uh, dramatists. I, I, I know he loves talking to a guy named Zeus. He loves uh, explaining these issues in his mind to somebody named Zeus. <laughs> Yeah, I want to throw th some lightning from the sky. <laughs> I've got some folks I'd like to zap with some lightning bolts. You know, uh, Zeus probably knows the uh, the secret for this. I want to know it myself. We actually, next time we need to talk to you about Lightning Network. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. <laughs> well, that was fun, as I said, you know, to watch the process of somebody being orange-pilled. Max had interviewed Zeus Oh, about six weeks ago, maybe seven weeks ago on Kaiser Report. And he was uh, definitely not ready for Bitcoin then. He was like open to it. But as you see, like he's he's orange pilled. He's he's about to be fully orange pilled. And he has some really interesting ideas about it. Right. So now he makes it safe for other academics to get orange pilled and talk about Bitcoin. Right. So the only economist, academic or professor that we have that's really been orange pilled is uh, Safe Dina Moose, who we orange pilled uh, back in 2013, 2014. You know, he was very skeptical about it back then. He eventually went down the rabbit hole, listened to a lot of Kaiser reports. And, you know, he's written the classic book, the Bitcoin Standard. So now we have Zeus, uh, who could be the second major academic in the world to get orange pilled. I, I had hope for a while for the Greek economist who was Yanis a, Varoufakis. Yanis Varoufakis, who was an advisor to a, a, a virtual currency uh, project for a while, but um, he is still, still very deeply mired in Keynesianism and uh, along with David Williams in, in Ireland, like they, they are just so ant antithetically inclined to understand what's going on here for the time being, but we can hopefully in 2021, they will, uh, evolve their their cosmic consciousness to a degree where they can throw away the Keynesian garbage and and accept the the Socratic truth of Bitcoin into their minds. Right, and then I have uh, some interesting tidbits that I learned in this past week that I want to share with you because it kind of goes with uh, a meme I saw out there going doing the rounds on Bitcoin Twitter, which was like it showed. Uh, a poor person versus a rich person and how they're dressed. And the poor person has like a $3,600 winter parka on and a $2,700 watch and like expensive shoes. Whereas like somebody like me and Max who grew up in uh, Connecticut, Westchester area, you know exactly what happens when the super wealthy, how they dress is like $25 shoes, uh, $10 t-shirt, you know, that's the way they dress. So I want to look at, um, my favorite period, the Renaissance, and I was, uh, have been studying a lot between Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, and Raphael, and all their rivalry and how much they were worth. So uh, Leonardo Da Vinci basically died, you know, p broke, because partly because he never finished his work, so he always had to hand the commission money back. Um, he lived well as well. So he lived very ostentatiously. He dressed in very elaborate pink like suits that he would prance around Florence with. And um, you know, all those notebooks, okay, he left us this great wealth of, of documents of his innovation and his ideas. But remember, paper was really expensive back then. So he spent a lot of money on all those papers. So he spent a lot of his wealth on that. Whereas Michelangelo... He died. Um, everybody thought he was poor because he dressed so raggedy and uh, was so unkempt and smelly and didn't take care of himself. But he died with uh, the 2002 equivalent of $50 million. So probably about $75 million. Um, and these are interesting. He left an estate worth 50,000 florins. And for the painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was paid 3,000 ducats which was worth $80,000 in um, 2017. Mm, right. Like Picasso said, he wants to be a rich man that lives like a poor man. So this is like a un, un, un misunderstood statement or people question, you know, what does this all mean? And, you know, it gets into the whole idea of what is wealth. And sure, the, the conspicuous consumption of people with not a lot of money is kind of tells the world that they don't have much money. Whereas uh, people with actually a lot of money 
it's hard to really detect or know that they are from their outward appearance. Um, you know, somebody with a lot of money will go the extra million to buy a Picasso, but not really bother getting a new pair of shoes, per se, uh, because the shoes don't have great value as an asset, uh, but the Picasso does. So they tend to think in terms of assets and mm. low time preference and amassing wealth over decades, generations. The conspicuous consuming poor person is thinking about, I, I want to get on a date this weekend. You know, they're, they have a high time preference, usually centered around the weekend. So, um, you know, that's the high, tef, high time preference, low time preference. That's one yes. of the lessons actually in Safety and Moose's book. You know, his book, The Bitcoin Standard, as I said, when I first interviewed him, it's really three books. It's a history of economics. It's a Bitcoin book. And it's a whole tutorial on high uh, time preference and low time preference. And I, I had heard those terms before reading the book, but I didn't really think about it much. And so the book really gets into it in quite in quite depth. And it has become now part of the vernacular of the Bitcoin community. People say high time preference, low time preference, as easily as they quote um, Nassim Taleb, who's uh, who saw his phrase anti-fragile has been adopted by the Bitcoin community and used quite often. So, so are the so is uh, Safe Dean's work. Right. And um, I mean, Leonardo himself did um, complain towards the end of his life that like God was punishing him for um, not that he believed in God. It was like that, you know, he was being punished for his uh, high time preference. Like he felt really guilty that he hadn't devoted more time to painting and said he had like socialized and pranced around and, and done all that. Whereas Michelangelo was famously very, very uh, solitary. He didn't like to have any company. He was uh, called squalid. People uh, considered him like. Well, Da Vinci, you know, probably had the problems that many rock stars have, which is that they live. Yeah. Right. You know, rock stars, they peak in their 20s, right? In early 30s. And like Jimi Hendrix and, and others, they, they famously die at the age of 27. Kurt Cobain hung himself. He's a 27, I believe. He got the yeah. year of 27 curse. There are, I think, Janis Joplin and uh, Jim Morrison. And there's many, many, many. Because you're, you're burning brightly, intense burning at that five years of your rock legendary uh, moment. And then if you survive, like um, then you curse. You become full of anger and hatred because you lived. Uh, you're supposed to go out on a rail, flaming, you know, Jesus Christ, superstar, multi-stage rocket. Like, you know, of course, uh, Hunter S. Thompson decided to pack his ashes into, killed himself, <laughs> and then put his ashes uh, on a fireworks display uh, with the celebrities and things like that. That's part so, of the reason why Johnny Depp went broke, by the way, yeah. is paying for that. That's part That that's part of the... the you know, the, the geniuses have this problem because you tend to peak early. And then, then what? You know, it's like, shit, now what do I do? But again, also through all of these things, um, you know, the competition leads to this greatness. Like a few great minds come together, where, whether it's Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, or, you know, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, uh, Botticelli, and Raphael. And they kind of inspire, they, it's funny, like, uh, you know, a thousand years later, nearly a couple hundred years later, that we could see, like, obviously it would be hard to tell who is the best, like who is the one master, Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo, or Raphael, right? Like They all suck compared to Satoshi. <laughs> but I want to also read like this hysterical thing because all three of them at one point were living in the Vatican under Julius II. And then, um, then Leonardo went to uh, France because he was broke, but also there was a competition to do the Pope's private quarters to paint that. And uh, who won? Raphael, who is young, the youngster. And this is a funny exchange, just that, um, you know, even these greats lack uh, self-knowledge. Like they're always having to try to, uh, they always doubt their own wisdom, doubt their own talent, doubt their own genius. So in a letter from late 1542, Michelangelo blamed the tensions between Pope Julius II and himself, nobody knows what he was referring to, on the envy of Raphael saying of the latter, all he had in art, he got from me. According to Gian Paolo Lamazzo, Michelangelo and Raphael met once. The former was alone, while the latter was accompanied by several others. So Michelangelo was alone, as he always is, and Raphael was surrounded by friends. Michelangelo commented that he thought 
he had encountered the chief of police with such an assemblage, and Raphael replied that he thought he had met an executioner as they are wont to walk alone. What a catty bitch. <laughs> Just in case people are wondering what this says, keep calm and hodl on. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. Well, you can't have self uh, ex- exploration without self doubt. Mm-hmm. Right? And self doubt can easily turn into self loathing. And that can easily slip into lots of other problems. So it's really fine. It's really tough to be curious without being doubtful, self-doubtful. You know, and being overly confident is not great because then you're not sufficiently curious to maintain engagement with the universe. You're just totally confident. And um, that um, can lead to dogma and authoritarianism and that's not that's not good either. So there is, you know, the, the I guess the Eastern philosophy of, of the way, the middle way, the the path, the the path of Siddhartha or Buddha. You know, the through the the balanced path where you're you're not too confident and you're not too doubtful. You know, you're and uh, I think again when you separate money from state with Bitcoin, people are free to have a safe journey into themselves. Right. The journey to self right now is like Alan Watts would talk about the taboo against knowing yourself. He wrote a book like that was the title. I think it was the taboo against knowing yourself or the taboo against self-knowledge. It's easy to find. But, you know, this idea of self-knowledge is really uh, not encouraged in society because because of this, this, the example of Socrates. If you were to genuinely question what's going on around you, the state gets really, really mad. The people in power get really upset because you're questioning their authority and then they become doubtful. And because they're not spiritually sound, their doubt turns to paranoia and that paranoia turns into all kinds of manifestations, ugly, ugly manifestations. So, you know, you know, here we are, you know, 21st century, 2,700 years after Socrates. And I think Bitcoin nails it. I think, you know, we've got now the way to, for us, to, for as a, as a species, to collectively go down that self-knowledge path without, without having too much doubt and without having too much confidence, but because it happens every 10 minutes and the emission schedule is all algorithmically generated, guaranteed per the protocol in a perfect balance. And all the um, incentives are perfectly matched. The price discovery is perfect. The hard money itself is perfect. And and so people who are coalescing around this perfection are enjoying the benefits of that perfection. Mind you, if your housemates are Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael, like I, I could see you doubting, with, like I could see that situation where even a Da Vinci or Michelangelo or Raphael, they might like look at the other and go, am I the best? <laughs> like, well, they, they have to, because as artists, you need to question and to probe into things that uh, no one's looking at. So, but the, but if you, if you take, if you get to loathing as a result of it, it, it then you shut yourself off from the creative light. So that's, that's the balance. And, but you know, well, Before we throw to Abe Cambridge now, I will say, like, these three guys rose and did their best work after that, you know, during that. And and, and they they didn't turn into a Peter Schiff and start um, just destroying their reputation out of envy and jealousy. Well, yeah, because the the products of their work were, were aesthetically beautiful and pleasing. So that's uplifting. So you could be a really a self hating troll, but if the product of your work is beautiful, it'll balance it out. So mm. like Bukowski was an excellent poet, but like this, you know, kind of a troll, like, or Serge Gainsbourg was a, a drunk <laughs> troll for 50 straight years. He, he said he resented sobriety because he hated the clarity. <laughs> he wasn't, he wasn't sober probably for 40 years straight at even one day, but the product was beautiful. So it kept him in that tension was sustained for decades until finally the alcohol won. And that was it. But he left behind a, a, a canon of work that is still respected. Same thing with these other artists. Van Gogh, everybody hated him. They couldn't stand to be around him because of his uh, drinking problem. Yeah, again, and the so. tension is there. I, some writer I met in Paris a long time ago was saying, like, he he drinks to forget and he writes to remember. Ah. Right? So you see this dynamic going on all the time. 
um, you need, it's interesting, I guess, to explore the workings of an artist because you need to really approach that fresh blank canvas without any, uh, preconceptions or biases. Right. And so you need to not know anything, but at the same time, you need to know everything that you do know. Right. And so, uh, that's part of the whole self-knowledge and, you know, people don't usually get a chance to explore that because, of the oppression that comes from a really faulty social contract that is now being rewritten by the Bitcoin, the timestamp, the chain of timestamps, right? I think I'm going to stop saying blockchain because blockchain is never mentioned in the white paper. Mm -hmm. It it referred to it as a chain of timestamps. So that's what Bitcoin uses, a a chain of timestamps. Forget blockchain. You know, other, these other bullshit projects use blockchain, Right. Well, this chain of this timestamp of this episode will now throw to somebody who knows himself. And he's here with the, the, the answer to that cliffhanger. Remember the last episode? This is Abe Cambridge of the sun exchange.com forward slash orange pill. There is no spoon. In a previous episode, you may have heard me talk about the utilization of space-based photovoltaics to beam solar energy from space to down here on Earth. But have you ever heard of people utilizing wind power in space as a propulsion mechanism to replace chemical energy? I am, of course, talking about the utilization of the solar wind to propel spacecrafts using a propulsion mechanism known as solar sails. These solar cells utilize charged particles from the sun to capture into an enormous sail capturing area to move the spacecraft forward. This means you are no longer limited to the amount of propellant you can store in a spacecraft and you can, in theory, move the spacecraft forever using the unlimited potential of capturing solar radiation. Now, this isn't even theoretical, this is real. The Japanese Space Agency in 2010 launched the Icarus spacecraft had a 0.007 millimeter thick sail, 20 meters in area, and they used it to prove that you can actually move a spacecraft or at least catch a force from the solar wind. And in 2015, the light sail two mission, with also using solar sail technology, is able to move that spacecraft two kilometers to adjust its orbital radius from the planet. And even NASA are now getting into this they've got a plan to launch a solar cruiser spacecraft which will use solar sail technology to sit itself in the L1 orbiting point between Earth and the Sun and just hover there, an act which would otherwise use propellant to stay there indefinitely, but using solar sails, it can just use that infinite energy source to put stay itself stationary, despite the fact it's being pulled between very large objects. Now, obviously, the coolest thing about this kind of space technology and the fact that we don't have limitations of propulsion means we can go very long distances and go very, very quickly. The current predictions are that using a solar sail, you can reach up to a fifth of the speed of light. Now, to transit to our nearest neighbor of Alpha Centauri using traditional chemical propulsion technology would take about 100 years. Using a solar sail at the fifth of the speed of light, you are decreasing that time to a mere 20 years. Now, if anyone watching wants to join me on that 40-year round mission to Alpha Centauri, do give me a bell. You need to give me a tweet. I'll see you on board. Well, hot damn, Max. That's, you know, s- sailing away into the orange pill. Mm. Right. You know, that sounds like something that Leonardo da Vinci would have imagined in these notebooks of his that made him go broke. Yeah. And yet left us this legacy of uh, imagination. And uh, would you uh, take this uh, solar sail thing to Alpha Centauri? Well, I had heard about solar sailing, but I had no idea that it was so fast, that it went uh, 20% of the speed of light. That is crazy, because when you hear about these things being light years away, um, well, now, if you get up to 20% of the speed of light, you know, then that's suddenly that space is, is condensed, you know, and so you can get to the other nearest galaxy within 20 years. So, I mean, you mentioned a 40-year round trip, but... Um, you know, if you go like Magellan left on his around the world exploration when the idea was that the earth was flat and that you would sail off the end of the earth. So <laughs> he was willing to die 
for that exploration. So a lot of people I'm sure would volunteer and say, look, I'm, let's go take this 20 year trip. And with the idea that we're going to find intelligent life and uh, we'll be, we will, we'll be okay. And, uh, so would I go for 20 years? Yeah, definitely. It sounds pretty good. I mean, depending on the ship, obviously I wouldn't want to be stuck in the chair for 20 years. It would have to be, you know, similar to a luxury cruise liner uh, with hydroponically raised, uh, you know, delicacies and like a pool. foie gras and cheese. Yeah, need a pool, you know, need a sun lamps, you need, uh, you know, recreation, you need, uh, you know, something from, uh, you know, we, we got to deck it out. We got to pimp my spaceship uh, before we go to the nearby galaxy. Full music, 24-7, <laughs> you know, they got to really uh, do it up. It needs to be like your your ship, the cargo ship he took, where by the, uh, they have the Italian chef on there to endure those uh, long periods of time crossing the ocean. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was on a cargo ship for three years. Back in <laughs> 1990, I took this across the Atlantic. And, uh, yeah, they had an Italian uh, chef, and we had this incredible uh, Italian meals every day. And that's another time for another day, another time for that story. That's an interesting story. I have some photos, too, from that, uh, which we can share on this uh, show. I t- kept a journal uh, for 20 years uh, when I was living in Europe, and it started off in 1990 on this cargo ship from New Jersey and uh, went across the Atlantic to uh, to France. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting. My comments back there as a 30-year-old, what I was thinking about at that time is interesting. Max was learning to know thyself, know himself as he journeyed across the Atlantic. That's right. Right, right, right. right. Well, I think it's a a good time to end here because we had that long conversation with Zeus. And I know your minds are probably blown from that and you need to absorb all of this. And, of course, Rick Stoner and RDBDC are hopefully coming up with some uh, memes about this already. Yeah, those guys are (laughs) meme-tastic. Rick Stoner. Bye. What a great name. All right, we're saying goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. bye. Yeah, baby.